Hello again, Bio220 students, microbiology online. Today we're going to get into the topic of viruses, viroids, and prions, the infectious pathogens that don't typically follow the cell or don't consist of a cell. Let's get into these awesome, awesome things. Oh. Let's look at these things. They're obligatory intracellular parasites, or which require living hosts in order to multiply. They will contain typically either DNA or a strand of RNA. Or I should say they will contain a genetic code of DNA or an RNA, sometimes a single strand, sometimes a double strand. And they will contain a surrounding protein coat. They do not have their own ribosomes and they do not have ATP generating mechanisms, so they will not be able to produce their own energy molecules without a host. There are a large variety that will infect uh, various organisms. And this is just basically comparing bacteria and viruses. Which again, viruses do not consist of a cell. Now the host range is simply the spectrum of organisms a virus can actually infect and replicate in. Most viruses infect only very specific types of cells in one particular host. And well, this can be determined by a specific host's attachment site on their cells to or on the virus to certain cellular factors. There is a specific type of virus called a bacteriophage, which will infect bacteria cells. And they can range from the size of 20 nanometers to thousands of nanometers in length. But they're not going to be the size of a cell. So, similar to viruses in being an infectious agent, there are also, there's what's ca called a virion. It is simply the complete put together virus particle that can go on to infect another cell. It consists of some nucleic acid, which is either DNA or RNA, and depending on the type of virus, it will either be a single strand or a double strand. The genetic code could be linear or it could be circular. It will consist of some protein capsid, which is composed of subunits called capsomeres. Usually these could be polygonal shapes like pentagons or hexagons that get put together into an overall shell. The envelope, is, if present, can be a lipid, protein, or carbohydrate coating that is present on some viruses. Coronavirus in particular has a lipid envelope. And there can be spike projections on the outer surface, which helps it attach to other cells. Cells will range, or I should say viruses will range quite a bit based off of their shape or morphology. Helical viruses are just hollow with cylindrical have a hollow cylindrical capsid. There are polyhedral viruses that have many edges and sides, pretty much polygons that were slapped together. Uh, there could be enveloped viruses, which just have a simple shell. And then there are complex viruses, which have complicated structures, very elaborate and ornate structures. And the outside portion that protects the DNA or RNA genetic code can vary from virus to virus. What was shown on the previous slide is a standard bacteriophage, which will go on to infect bacteria cells. As far as the taxonomy the way of organizing different types of viruses, it's a little more difficult since it's not 
based off of a cell that can have similar structures from one cell to the other. But instead, viruses will have a genus where the name ends in virus, and then a family of viruses will have some common name that ends in viridae. And as far as the order, the name will end in alice. So for a viral species, it's a group of viruses sharing the same genetic information, as well as ecological niche, which is essentially saying they share the same type of host. There are descriptive common names which are used for species, but there are also subspecies that will need to be designated or distinguished by some number. For growing bacteriophages in a laboratory for research, viruses will need to be grown and replicated in living cells. For bacteriophage viruses, they need to be grown in bacteria. Bacteriophages will form plaques, which are clearings on a lawn of bacteria in a medium or a culture on the surface of agar. And each plaque corresponds to a single virus and can be expressed as plaque forming units or PFUs. Now for growing animal viruses that requires the use of animal uh, animals, typically it could include embryonic eggs where the virus is injected into say a chicken egg and used as a source to replicate much of the virus. And virus growth is signaled by changes or death of the embryo. For cell cultures, tissues are treated with enzymes to separate cells apart. Virally infected cells are detected via deterioration known as the cytopathic effect. And then continuous cell lines are used for further replicating the viral material. Essentially, most cells will grow in a single layer or a monolayer, but those that have been transformed by some virus or such do not grow in the typical monolayer and can grow in some clump. For cytopathic, for viral identification involves identifying either the cytopathic effects performed on those cells. It could involve serological tests such as Western blotting, where you take the reaction of a virus with antibodies against that virus to show signals on an on a analysis. And also it can involve looking for nucleic acids such as RFLPs and using polymerase chain reaction or PCR to amplify a limited number of nucleic acids into a large amount. Now, for a virus to multiply, it must invade a host cell. It must have a way of entering past the plasma membrane, and it must take over the host's natural metabolic machinery in order to reproduce its own genetic code on a large scale. For example, one step growth curve is involved. Essentially, the number of virions or complete viruses will grow in a matter of time, will grow time. After the vi virions are released from a host cell, you will notice an acute infection until immunity starts diminishing the number of free-floating viruses, virions. During the lytic cycle, that's when a phage or an infectious virus causes lysis 
uh, and death of a host cell. This is when they burst out of that cell. To infect new cells, the lysogenic cycle involves phage or virus DNA that gets incorporated into the host's own DNA, which involves phage conversion and then specialized transduction processes. T even bacteriophages within the lytic cycle. The attachment is done through when the phage or virus particle attaches by the tail fibers to a host cell. Penetration involves the phage lysozyme opening up the cell wall. The tail sheath contracts to force the tail core and DNA of that virus into the internal parts of the cell. And in biosynthesis, the production of the phage's own genetic material and proteins for its capsid are produced in that cell. Essentially what's happening, once the genetic code enters a cell, the virus's genetic code, either DNA or RNA, has to both one, replicate itself, and two, be used as a template to eventually form the proteins involved in the virus's own protein capsid. And then eventually both have to combine back together during maturation, which is the assembly of the phage particle. And then releases the stage where the phage's own lysosome breaks apart the cell wall and bursts forth from the host cell. During lysogeny, the phage remains latent. Essentially, it is present, but is not replicating. Phage DNA will be incorporated into a cell's own DNA. Viruses that through this process of adding their genome into a host cell's genome are typically called retroviruses. And when the host cell replicates its own chromosome, it also replicates the prophage DNA or the genetic material from the virus that has been incorporated into the host's own genetic code. This results in phase conversion, where the host cell exhibits new properties. For specialized transduction, that's when specific bacterial genes are transferred to another bacterium because of a virus, because of a phage, where essentially one virus helps transfer genes from one bacteria to another. Changes in genetic properties will occur for the living bacteria. Bacteriophage and animal viral multiplication being compared. Well, the viruses that infect bacteria and the viruses that infect vir uh, animals, eukaryotic organisms, well, they have slight variation. Typically with bacterial phages, those that infect prokaryotes, the viral genetic code is injected into the cell, whereas in animal viruses, typically the protein capsid has to bind to a receptor on the outside of the host animal cell, and then be engulfed into the cell instead of just leaving its own DNA and dispersing it into the cell. And there is a situation called an enveloped virus, which essentially means that when that virus virion forms inside the host animal cell. If it is an enveloped virus, instead of bursting out of the cell, its protein code and genetic material combination will go toward the plasma membrane and then as, and bud off, peeling off part of the plasma membrane to form its own phospholipid, bi or phospholipid covering which can then fuse to the plasma membrane of a new healthy cell to infect another cell.
whereas non-enveloped animal viruses will simply rupture the plasma membrane, killing the cell. For multiplication in animal cells, the attachment involves the virus attaching to the cell's membrane instead of trying to find a cell wall. There is entry due to a connection between a receptor on the host cell and the virus capsid. This, this causes receptor mediated, remediated endocytosis or fusion where the virus as a whole is then able to enter the host cell. The uncoding is when the virus, when the viral uncoding is done by viral or host enzymes to release its genetic material. And then biosynthesis involves the production of nucleic acid and the proteins involved in the capsid of the virus. Maturation is when the nucleic acid and capsid proteins come together to form a functional virion. And then the re release can occur by budding, by budding off of the plasma membrane and having a lipid layer around that virus or through rupture in the case of non-enveloped viruses that simply burst out of the cells. This is an example of a budding or an enveloped virus that takes a portion of the plasma membrane with it as a protective coat as it goes on to infect another cell. Now, the biosynthesis of DNA viruses. Well, the DNA, DNA viruses will replicate their DNA in the nucleus of the host using viral enzymes that the virus encodes for. The synthesis of the capsid in the cytoplasm occurs using the host's own enzymes. Now, for an example of adenoviridae, or a family of adenoviruses, these are double-stranded DNA viruses that do not have an envelope around them. Essentially what this is, it's a type of virus where its genetic code is a double strand of DNA. They can cause respiratory infections in humans and as well as can be a source of tumors. There is also another example of a family of viruses called Poxviridae. They also have a double strand of DNA, but they are envelopes around their capsid and they can cause skin lesions. Uh, Examples include vaccinia as well as smallpox viruses, where smallpox is a member of the orthopox virus. Now, herpes viridae is another family of multiple viruses that have double-stranded DNA in their genetic material, but and are also enveloped. And the different types of human herpes virus, HHV, can vary. And some can cause cold sores, and some can be sexually transmitted diseases or sexually transmitted infections. Papoviridae are another type of double-stranded DNA virus, but does not have an envelope. Example could be papilloma, papilloma virus, which causes warts and can transform cells and cause them to become cancerous cells, which is when they'll at times not grow in a layer, but grow in clumps. Apadnaviridae are also double-stranded DNA viruses that are enveloped. This can include hepatitis B viruses, which use transcriptase to make DNA from an RNA template within the host cell. Now other types of viruses. Some viruses multiply in the host cytoplasm using RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This is, an, this is a 
particular enzyme that helps produce uh, h- helps produce strands of RNA. SSRNA is a type of virus where its genetic code is a single strand of ribonucleic acid instead of a single or double strand of DNA. Now, these single-stranded RNA viruses can be plus sense or minus sense. In the plus sense, that viral RNA serves as the actual mRNA or messenger RNA sequence that is directly used for protein synthesis. In the case of single-stranded RNA viruses that are minus sense or antisense, the viral genetic code inside that virion needs to first be transcribed in the host to the complementary RNA strand, which is the mRNA strand that can then be used for protein synthesis. And in the case of dsRNA or double-stranded RNA viruses, these viruses have both the antisense strand and the plus sense strand, where the plus sense strand of the double-stranded RNA can be used to directly encode for protein synthesis, and the other strand in the double-strand RNA virus can be used to replicate and form more plus-strand RNA. For the biosynthesis of RNA viruses, where their genetic code is ribonucleic acid, one example would be picornaviridae, which its genetic code is a single strand of RNA. It is the plus sense, which means it is actually the messenger RNA that can then be in, that can then be translated into protein material. It is non-enveloped, and an example could be enterovirus, which includes poliovirus and Kasakius virus. There are also rhinovirus, which cause the common cold. There are hepatitis A viruses as well. Now, Togaviridae includes a single-stranded RNA, which is also the plus sense strand, but these are envelopes. These have a protective coating around the capsid. One involves the alpha virus, which can be transmitted by arthropods and includes chikungunya, and there are rubivirus, which causes rubella. Rhabdoviridae are single-stranded RNA viruses where the genome of the virion is the minus sense strand or the anti-sense strand. The minus sense needs to, once in the host, be transcribed into the mRNA strand, the complementary strand, and then that new strand can then form, be used in translation to form the protein for the virus. One example of this would be Lisa virus, which causes rabies. And then there are also numerous other examples within the animal kingdom of diseases caused by Rhabdoviridae. For Rioviridae, this is an example of a double-stranded RNA virus that is non-enveloped. One example is Riovirus, which causes respiratory enteric orphan. And then there's Rotavirus, which causes mild respiratory infections and gastroenteritis, or inflammation of the gastric system. When in the case of a single-stranded RNA, well, there, there are special viruses that actually have a single strand of RNA that once in the host will be used to produce DNA, viral DNA. And then reverse transcriptase is used to produce DNA 
from the viral genome. Viral DNA then integrates into the host chromosome as a provirus. These are examples of retroviruses where they encode a form of their genome into the host itself. One can be lentivirus, which causes HIV, and also oncovirus, oncoviruses. Now, viruses can also cause cancer, of which several types of cancer are caused by viral infections. They may develop well, well after the initial viral infection. And then there are cancers that are caused by viruses that are not actually contagious themselves. One example is sarcoma, which is a cancer of connective tissue, tendons, joints, ligaments, etc. And there is adenocarcinomas, which are cancers of glandular epithelial tissue along the skin. Genes called oncogenes transform normal cells into cancer cells. The problem is oncogenes are normal parts of our own genome. But when they become activated, they will cause cancer. So some viruses actually activate the oncogenes in our own genome, which then results in various types of cancers. For oncogenic viruses, they'll become integrated into a host cell's DNA and eventually induce tumors. A transformed cell harbors a tumor-specific transplant antigen, TSDA, on its surface and a T antigen in the nucleus. Now, types of oncogenic viruses, viruses that can activate our oncogenes and cause cancer, include adenoviruses, adenoviridae, herpesviridae, like the Epstein-Barr virus, poxviridae, papovavir papovaviridae, which can cause human papillomavirus, Hepatinaviridae, which can cause hepatitis B. And then the very nasty retroviridae, which consists of viral RNA that once inside the host is transcribed into DNA through the use of the viral enzyme reverse transcriptase, which can then integrate into the host's own DNA profile. HCLV1 and HCLV2 will cause adult T-cell leukemia and lymphoma, respectively. Latent viruses, they will not cause norm, uh, observed symptoms in the host for easily long periods of time. But when the conditions are right, then they will cause symptoms. They may reactivate due to changes in immunity, and some symptoms can involve cold sores or even shingles from the original chicken pox virus. A persistent viral infection occurs gradually over a long period and is generally fatal. One example could be subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, or the measles virus. Now, by the phrase reactive due to changes in immunity, with the example of the chickenpox virus, where you can get chickenpox at an early age, that virus is still present inside your body, and say when you get older and your immunity is not as strong as it used to, the virus may go on to develop shingles. Now, acute infection typically occurs a few days after the initial 
number of virions become extremely high. And then it will, once the immunity takes hold, they'll typically drop off significantly. But depending on the type of virus, if it is a persistent infection, it may slowly grow with time in the months and years to come. And if it is a latent infection, essentially it goes dormant inside the body. Nothing will be noticed until the virus becomes reactivated later down the line. And these are just examples of latent and persistent viruses, those that can go dormant and those that can stay active over a long period of time. Now getting into prions, these are infectious proteins. Proteinaceous infectious particles or prions, they can be inherited and are transmissible by ingestion from contaminated food, transplants, and surgical instruments as well. An example includes spongiform encephalopathies like mad cow disease, disease creutzfeldt jakob disease, german strassler schneiken syndrome, fatal familial insomnia, and sheep scraby. PRPC, or prions, they are normal cellular prion protein on the cell surface. PRPSCs are scraby proteins and they accumulate in the brain cells, forming large plaques. Essentially, how a protein can be infectious is that you may have one type of protein within your system that is a healthy functional version. But, and in, but there might be a distorted version of that particular protein that then goes on to encourage the healthy form to become distorted as well, increasing in number and eventually going on to form large areas of damage inside the body. Now, Prions, infectious proteins, they typically infect animal cells, but there are what are called viroids that will infect typically plant cells. And also there are plant viruses as well. Just to reiterate, viruses have a genetic code and a protein code. Prions are just infectious proteins and viroids are just infectious genetic material. So plant viruses, they can enter through wounds or via insects that feed on the plants. And plant cells are generally protected from disease by a very strong and permeable cell wall. Viroids just consist of short pieces of exposed infectious RNA, and these can cause potato and spindle tuber disease. By exposed RNA, that just means that as a viroid, it does not have an external protein coat. And these are just examples of classification of major viral agents. So key takeaway, there are vi viroids which infect plants typically and consist of just RNA. There are prions, which are infectious proteins that infect typically animal cells. And then there are viruses, which consist of genetic material, either RNA or DNA, as well as a protein coat that consists of, that can have a host that's either an animal or a host that is a plant. And that concludes this very fun lesson to give on chapter 13 viruses, prions, and viroids. Well, eh, nothing to say. Keep on 
what you all are doing. This is a very, this is a lot of information and well, eh, you all amaze me. All right then, well, peace out again.